Hi, hello there. Happy Valentine's Day. You just know there's going to be trouble when I start an episode like that. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. And I am your host, she who really doesn't care for Valentine's Day or any of that nonsense and thus is bringing you another fun episode where I blow up all your dreams and schemes. Liv. That was long-winded. But yeah, my name is Liv, but you probably know that by now. With Valentine's Day falling on a Tuesday this year, I just knew I had to do a special episode dedicated to this weird and capitalistic nonsense holiday. Particularly because, well, there are some bizarre connections with Greek mythology. Or rather, more explicitly, Roman. So today we're talking all things love. That is, all things Eros and Cupid. Because, I mean, gods know love in Greek mythology is both entirely and completely determined by either him or Aphrodite. And it rarely, rarely goes well. Or rather, it rarely goes well for both parties. <laughs> you know, in preparing for this or thinking what I could do for a Valentine's Day episode, I first, I first googled the most romantic Greek myths, just to see what the varied, you know, listicles might have come up with that maybe could help me. But, um, <laughs> wow. I mean, should I have been surprised that all of the so-called romantic stories are either stories of women being possessed by men they had little to no interest in or straight up tragedy and death? No, I most certainly shouldn't have been surprised. And yet here we are. I managed to be surprised. Because here's what the suggestions that Google gives us for the most explicitly romantic myths of ancient Greece. First, Hero and Leander. Okay, yeah, this is romantic. It's also tragic as fuck and, and barely survives in any kind of Greek source, but I will give it to them. It is not a bad suggestion. Next, Orpheus and Eurydice. And like, okay, fine? But I think it's a bit of a stretch, given we get zero indication at any point that Eurydice feels anything for Orpheus. Still, travel to the underworld for her? Romantic. He fucked up very simple instructions and caused her to die all over again, which is, you know, less than romantic. And then there's Pygmalion and Galatea, which is just... Ick, ick. Ick. I have covered that on the show before. You can look for it, but that is basically the incel origin story. A man who couldn't find a real woman who loved him, so he made a woman for himself. Gross. Eros and Psyche is obviously on these lists a lot. And like, okay, fine. I know I've convinced all of you that this is the most romantic story ever. And sometimes I actually feel a bit bad about that because if you really think about all of it, it's actually pretty creepy. Like, yeah, I mean, it's it's all pretty creepy. I do love all of Psyche's trials, though. She proves herself to be a real badass. But still, I mean, it's creepy. <laughs> and then another that appears a lot on these lists is Atalanta and Hippomenes. And I mean, gods, I call all the bullshit on that one. Like, I am sorry, but the story of a woman explicitly not wanting to marry anyone and having a man literally cheat in a contest in order to force her into marriage is not romantic that's not romantic and then okay i found a list that calls itself inspirational love stories from ancient greece <laughs> that one is even wilder because i mean inspirational and what stories do we find inspirational i won't share all of them just the most egregious because like this episode is really about eros i'm just having fun with this nonsense but the second on the list is Paris and Helen. Paris and Helen. <laughs> yeah, the couple where we have absolutely no sourcing that suggests that she actually really loved him or necessarily even went willingly, let alone the fact that it started the biggest war ever. Chill, cool, inspirational. <laughs> Do you want to start a continent-spanning, generation-destroying war because of a crush? Do it up. Inspiration. 
And next in the wild inspirational love stories is Zeus and Europa. (laughs) Yeah, for real. The woman kidnapped by a man who appeared to her as a bull and then literally swam off to another continent and never let her return home. Chill stuff. Super inspiring. About as inspiring as the next one, Apollo and Daphne. (laughs) Or Narcissus and Echo. Inspirational. I too want a man to become so obsessed with me that he stalks me until I'm forced to become an inanimate object in order to escape him. Or maybe you're inspired by Echo and Narcissus, a pair who are equally ridiculous and weird in different ways and, like, basically don't care about each other at all. What a love story theirs is. Fuck, sometimes I just love to Google Greek myth stuff because 90% of the stuff out there just has zero grasp on what actually exists in the ancient sources and how truly wild and wacky and gross and bizarre it all is. I mean, in the best way, but inspirational. Zeus and Europa. (sighs) And as a bonus, Odysseus and Penelope also appear on a lot of these lists. And while I think their story might actually be one of the least weird and problematic, it ultimately comes after Odysseus spent about 20 years periodically cheating on his wife with a whole swath of women, both consensually and newly enslaved. (laughs) So, I mean, a perfect love story. Theirs is not. Because, well... Love isn't particularly good or appealing in most of Greek mythology. And that's why I'm here today. That's usually to do with the man who this episode is actually about. Eros. Cupid. The god of love and desire. This is episode 199, TikTok teen heartthrob Eros or creepy Cupid Cherub, the evolution of the god of love. What is romance in the ancient Greek world? Without looking into any smarter person's interpretation of this question, I would say that it just really wasn't in the realm of what we consider today. The love stories of Greek myth aren't so much about romance, but tragedy more often than not. I won't guess what that says about how the ancient Greeks saw the very idea of love, or rather the idea of a loving and fulfilling relationship, because it seems to me that every couple that might have actually had a chance at being happy in love, with one another at least, (laughs) ends in tragedy. Okay, maybe like not everyone, but absolutely definitely most of them. And certainly all the queer ones. Phew. So what did ancient Greek mythology actually think about love and desire? Well, to put it in the simplest of terms, they thought that it was all, and I mean all of it, determined by Eros and Aphrodite. And at the same time, they didn't think that? Let's get into it. Now, I would love to know more about what we do or do not know in terms of what, like, the everyday person in the ancient world thought about these topics, but frankly, I have zero idea where to look, and after that five weeks of heavy historical Spartan research, I absolutely need to go back to straight-up myth for a while, because it is something I actually know how to do, and it doesn't burn me out to near exhaustion. So today is myth. Or rather, how the myths treat love and desire, and most specifically, Eros, later Cupid the god of love and desire. Because that's one thing that's always been really clear to me in reading the ancient sources. These things are one and the same. You cannot have love without Eros or Aphrodite, and you cannot have desire without one of them either. They determine who you love, who you desire, and if you love or desire someone, it was at their own hands. There seems to be no other option. And that is in large part just because of how mythology was viewed in the ancient world, particularly in archaic sources, And classical too, even if there is a bit more of an examination on what humanity is beyond the gods. But the gods are the concepts that they control. They are the embodiment of those things. It's most obvious when I talk about the personification gods, when you wonderful listeners ache for stories of Nike, goddess of victory, or Thanatos, god of death. These gods and hundreds of others are essentially without stories in the ancient world because it wasn't about the stories. It was about the concepts that they embodied, that they personified. 
While Eros features into many, many stories, the same does apply to him. He is love, desire, and thus, particularly in the ancient Greek sources, when those things are at hand, it is because of him. And beyond controlling the love and sex lives of others, Eros actually has little involvement in much at all. And I know you're all screaming the name Psyche at me, but I will remind you that the entire story of Cupid and Psyche exists only in Roman sourcing, and not even technically what we would see as traditional mythology, because it's actually just a side story in a Roman novel called The Metamorphoses, or better known as The Golden Ass by Epileus. That doesn't make it any less valid, but if we're talking about mythology specifically, and Greek even more specifically, it just does not fit. While Psyche as a goddess does appear to have existed in Greek tradition and was probably involved with Eros, their actual story of like their romantic whole beginnings and everything in there is entirely Roman, as far as we know. So what is Eros in Greek myth? Oh gods, he is so many things. First though, we have to separate the ideas of Eros, the ideas of love and desire. There are, kind of, two different gods of love, two different gods called Eros in the Greek tradition. It is partially a matter of sourcing and time periods and lots more, but also there are pretty explicitly separate gods broadly. So I think it's best understood as there being these two different gods and thus two different types of love. See, in Hesiod's Theogony, Eros, love, was one of the first beings to come into existence, to spring from that chaos that started everything. This Eros is sometimes called the Protogenos Eros, that is, firstborn. This Eros is a primordial being, he's ancient and all-powerful, all-encompassing. I call him Big Love. And then there's the other Eros, the Eros that we know from the stories, the son of Aphrodite. Even in Hesiod, these two Eros are separated, though it isn't entirely explicit who this second Eros is born from. This Eros, in that case at least, might have been born either from Aphrodite alone, or from the genitals of Uranos itself, or Aphrodite and the genitals of Uranos. Because, you know, she's born from the castration foam, and possibly gets impregnated by it, and then births Eros at the same time? Maybe? Very normal stuff. Not to worry. In that case, too, he actually comes into being alongside a sibling, Himeros, Desire who is like not really mentioned beyond this moment. He's much more of a personification god than Eros. Regardless, we get these two different ideas of love, what I call big love and little love. Big love, this protogenos Eros, at least how I describe it, is the very idea of love, the kind of love that just naturally exists within humanity, within the world. It's like the notion of it at all. Like nothing would exist without it, and the procreation that comes along with it, it is big love. And little love, the Eros that is the son of Aphrodite, the Eros that is running around with his bow and arrow, fucking up lives and starting wars, that's little love. That's the day-to-day -day love. That's relationships and spats, sex and desire. It's the very human, very contagious and dangerous and overpowering love. The kind of love that can come and go, it starts hot and it fizzles out entirely. That is little love. Today we're concerned with little love, but mostly because there is little else to say about big love because... It is too big. It doesn't really figure into stories or myths at all beyond this important introduction by Hesiod. It is there. It is all around us. It started everything. But it doesn't care about your day to day. That is what Eros, son of Aphrodite, is for. And boy, does he go about love in a different way. A much more fun way. As long as you're not the one experiencing it. One of the best examples of how the concept of love, at least in some cases, is understood in Greek mythology, in my opinion, is found in the Argonautica, the epic poem from the Hellenistic period that tells the story of Jason and the Argonauts. I have covered this story a lot and have actually read the whole epic poem on the podcast, and one of those most incredible and entertaining moments is when Medea falls in love 
with Jason. Because particularly in this source, she falls in love completely due to the machinations of Eros and Aphrodite. They force this love upon her and it takes over her life, almost makes her a different person entirely. And it's so clear that it isn't anything that she would have wished upon herself. That's how it goes in all of the stories that feature Eros and often Aphrodite. They control love. Basically, they are love itself. Because Aphrodite is the Olympian of the two, she has much more of a role outside of inflicting love on others. But Eros, like, that's his whole job, at least when it comes to the surviving Greek mythology. Because remember, Cupid and Psyche is called Cupid and Psyche for a reason. While that story is great and detailed in the most rare of ways, it is very, very Roman. Like I said, Psyche existed in Greek myth, that is for sure. But she was, and she was probably with Eros romantically. But the story of their relationship and all its trials, that's very Roman. I didn't mean to say this twice, but I'm keeping it in. (laughs) But... To me, it makes perfect sense that the story was invented during the Roman period because Eros really does play a very particular role in the surviving Greek myths. And it isn't one that requires him to have his own story. His own relationships aren't the point because his entire role throughout mythology is just to be the catalyst for other people's love stories. It all comes back to that age old thing that I spend so much of my time telling you all. That the stories from the ancient Greek world aren't like the stories we create today. They served an entirely different purpose back then, and that results in stories that might sometimes seem lacking to us, or confusing, or generally, like, unfinished. But they're not. It isn't that Eros isn't getting the love story he deserves, or that he's an unimportant character. It's that he is, himself, a plot device, rather than a main character. Eros, the word, simply means love. It's both the word love and the god's name, hence why his entire point is to serve this role and why there can be two eroses of different forms. It just means love. I think a lot of people find this kind of disappointing because they want stories of these characters. They want plots and details, excitement and romance. They want what we think of today when we think of stories and storytelling broadly. But frankly, I much prefer the intricacies of Greek myth, the realization that it isn't that he's missing stories or lacking details, it's that he is the detail for everyone else. Eros is love, and love is Eros. So let's look at those times that Eros served as this plot device, this detail within Greek myth, shall we? One of the things that stands out most from the ancient Greek depiction of Eros is, well, (laughs) he's kind of an asshole. There are few to no stories where the love that Eros inflicts upon humans or gods is good and beneficial to both parties. He is more troublemaker than romantic, more dangerous than benevolent. Frankly, it makes for more entertaining stories for us, but I do think it's important to realize how the concept of love, and thus the concept of the Greek god Eros, was actually viewed in the sourcing that we have. As always, I have gone to my favorite place on the internet, theoi.com, to take a look at how certain sources viewed Eros and his means of inflicting love upon unsuspecting people. So let's look at a few choice quotes that really emphasize how he is sometimes viewed, particularly when he is serving as a plot device. So first we have a little fragment of poetry from the 6th century BCE, a guy named Theognis. He wrote about Eros' work uh, inflicting love on some of the most famous of heroes. Quote, Cruel Eros, the mani took you up and nursed you. Because of you, Troy's Acropolis was destroyed, and great Theseus, Aegeus' son, and noble Ajax, Oileus' son, through your acts of recklessness. Now, this line is really interesting because it seems to serve to take the blame away from the heroes themselves. 
He is talking about Paris' abduction of Helen, then Theseus' earlier abduction of Helen, and then Ajax's rape of Cassandra, which happened during the war itself. And not only is he placing the onus on Eros, cruel Eros, for all of these things, but on mania, too. In referencing the mania, who are spirits of mania, those kind of personification gods that I talk about so often. Now, obviously, we can't know the poet's full intention here, whether he's actually trying to take the blame completely off of these heroes or whether he's just singing about how these things happen. But regardless, I think it can be read as a means of moralizing these heroes, like taking the blame off of them for acts that are objectively bad and instead placing it on Eros, like just love as a concept and mania within it. And then, of course, we have the example that I talked about earlier, but I'm now going to show you actual evidence from that incredible moment in the Argonautica when Medea falls in love with Jason, not because of any natural inclination or attraction, but because the gods of love explicitly force it upon her. The descriptions of this are just like, they are, they're too good to pass up. Like this line, quote, Medea's whole body was possessed by agony a searing pain which shot along her nerves and deep into the nape of her neck, that vulnerable spot where the relentless archer of Eros causes the keenest pangs. She's literally in pain, agony, at the experience of quote-unquote falling in love (laughs) with Jason. And it's not just Medea who knows it's happening either. Later there's a scene where Selene, the moon herself, talks to Medea about what's happening to her. She says, quote, The little god of mischief has given you Jason, and many a heartache with him. Well, go your way, but clever as you are, steal yourself now to face a life of sighs and misery. Like, no part of this experience seems to be even remotely enjoyable for Medea, and every single person around her knows it. Except, I guess, for Jason? <laughs> Rather, all the gods know it, and they're just all like, well, I guess Hera just gets to do this to this woman. She just gets to use the gods of love to do whatever she needs. Like, no problems here. And just to really emphasize it, like how much this is absolutely beyond Medea's control. Here is another quote about Eros himself, or rather, love itself. The combination, really, because it's this section of this epic poem that really wants to drill in to everyone's minds not only how fucking awful love can be sometimes, but also how completely out of human control it can feel. It is poignant. Like, Apollonius is really making the point beyond Medea here. It's about humanity and love and how it's all inflicted by the gods and we're all kind of powerless in the end. Fun, right? Anyway, here's the quote. Unconscionable Eros, bane and tormentor of mankind, parent of strife, fountain of tears, source of a thousand ills, rise mighty power and fall on the sons of our enemies with all the force you used upon Medea when you filled her with insensate fury. Anyway, have I mentioned how obsessed I am with the depiction of Eros, love, and Apollonius' Argonautica? It's incredible. It's amazing. Dark. Weird. So good. Fuck you, Jason. glaring question that arises when we consider the modern notion of Cupid, that weird cherubic baby with a bow and arrow who haunts the Isles of Hallmark this time of year, is where, in Zeus's name, did the baby bit come from? Or I think we're better off starting with where did the multiplying of arrows come into play, because that happens before the baby's This idea of multiple deities surrounding the idea of love. And it comes from the ancient Greek world before it transitions into the weird cherubic babies of our time. These gods are called the Erotes. The Erotes are an interesting bunch because they are most commonly found in poetry rather than mythology. 
Now, while most ancient mythological sources are also poetry, poetry wasn't always mythological. We might see it as mythological now because it's always featuring the names of the gods, like invocations and things like that, but it isn't actually mythological tellings. It's just how these things went in the ancient world. Like you're talking about love in a poem, you're going to use Eros's name because it means love. There are references to the erotes found in poetry by Sappho, Pindar, and others, but those two are probably the most famous ancient Greek poets, so they're the perfect way to introduce the erotes as a concept. But before we get too deep into that, who are the erotes that you might ask? Or you just want to give me an excuse to share more Greek mythological names? Awesome. Thank you for doing me that favor. You know how I love it. The number of erotes that there are, though, and their names is not remotely agreed upon. Like, if you think the number of, say, the gray eye is uncertain, or the number of nymphs, you clearly haven't found the erotes. Because basically, they're gods of love and passion, and they are also baffling. Mostly because, like I said, they're more important to poets than they are to mythographers. That means it doesn't really matter who they were, what their names might have been, or how many there might have been that existed, because the purpose of them was just to convey the varied aspects of love, and sex. But again, because I want to say their names, according to my beloved Theoi.com, these are the possible names of all the possible erotes. So Eros is number one. Yes, he counts as an erote. Both big love and little love count because love. Him, Eros, is the other. He's the god of sexual desire. He's as ancient as Eros, too, in the sources. He appears in Hesiod's Theogony, like I mentioned at the top, born alongside Eros after Aphrodite's birth from the castration foam. Then there's the lesser, more question mark of Erotes. There's Herilogos, the god of sweet talk and flattery. Hermaphroditos, I've told their story before, and they too sometimes count as an Erote, the, the god of intersexuality, whose story is a bummer. Uh, then there's Anteros, the god of mutual love, or like having your love returned. Hymenaeus, the god of wedding ceremonies. And Pothos, the god of passionate longing, and a plant that is threatening to take over my apartment. Like I said, these erotes, the very concept of them, they don't really appear in mythology proper, that is, the general stories and anecdotes that form myth. Instead, they appear in poetry of the ancient world, just lyric poetry. And I want to look at some of those pieces. Like so many characters, they're just little references here and there. Things like Pindar calling Aphrodite, quote, the heavenly mother of Erotes. Or another line where he says, quote, may I delight in the graces of Aphrodisian Erotes? This really just means love, broadly, because again, this is just a word for love, and like so many words in ancient Greek writing, it becomes personified, made real. Of course, like I said, there's also our beloved Sappho, the woman poet from Lesbos, Slur Island, as my Twitter followers will know it. In her love poetry, she sings things like, quote, sweet speaking erotes. Or better, she calls out the erotes for their less enjoyable aspects of love and desire, telling them, quote, You are violent and wicked, and you do not know against whom you will hurl your weapons. Gods, I love Sappho. So these erotes, while minimally important in the grander scheme of Greek mythology, are likely the reason that we have the idea of multiple cupids or cherubs, this weird little habit the world has of having a bunch of chubby babies flying around with bows and arrows and hearts everywhere. But obviously, there's still the cupid of it all, let alone what I will call the babyfication of the god of love. As always, the thing we have to keep in mind when looking at anything like this is just how much time passes between all of our sources. Eros is introduced to us, both big love and little love, in Hesiod's Theogony, which was is one of the oldest surviving sources that we have from the ancient Greek world. It is very old, like 7th or 8th century BCE old. While Hesiod doesn't really give us much on either Eros as a character... Based on slightly later visual depictions and stories that we have, we can tell pretty clearly that he is most often depicted as a teenaged son of Aphrodite. 
He's kind of puckish. He's a troublemaker who sets people on the course of love, not for romantic reasons, but basically just to fuck with them. While I haven't been able to go through all the varied references to Eros in ancient Greek sources and imagery, I think it's pretty clear across the board, at least when it comes to his stories, stories, that he is sort of teenaged. That said, in Greek pottery, children are often presented as just tiny adults, so it's kind of tough to tell if he's being seen as like a teenager, like a young adult, and he's appearing smaller due to space constraints on the pieces of pottery, or if he's actually being understood to be a child. Because they're just, they're little and they're human and they don't look like babies, they just look like tiny adults. It's the wonders of Greek pottery. We love and we hate it. Regardless, by about the 4th century, there's less certainty as to Eros' age. He's depicted more and more as a child in art, particularly, at least based on what I've seen, in Hellenistic statues. I'm thinking of one specifically, this deeply iconic piece that's in the National Archaeological Museum in Athens, where Eros becomes pretty explicitly a baby. I wish I knew how to find more details on how and when this babification happens exactly, but quite frankly, I need to stick to the mythology right now because my brain uh, is melted into a fine goo after all those weeks researching the in-depth history of Sparta. So we're going based on what I know and what I have seen. And like I said, the Hellenistic period saw a real transition in Greece, both in terms of leadership and culture and very prominently art. So Hellenistic statues are some of the most incredible pieces that you will ever see. Like if you imagine the most beautifully detailed sculptures from the ancient world, you're probably imagining the Hellenistic sculptures. The the piece I'm thinking of specifically is Aphrodite being approached by Pan and Eros is tiny, the babies flying up next to her. And Pan is basically trying to assault her while Aphrodite fends him off with a sandal in her hand. It's one of the best and most entertaining pieces. And yes, every time I post it anywhere, there will be someone referencing a chunkla, which I won't pretend I fully understand or even know how to pronounce because I'm a very white Canadian. But through this statue alone, I have learned that threatening to hit your children or people generally with one sandal is a timeless tradition that spanned continents. So how nice, I guess. (laughs) In any case, by the 1st or 2nd century BCE, it seems like Eros has become a baby, in the eyes of at least the visual depictions. And then, well, we have Rome to account for. I won't dwell on this, but I do want to remind you that contrary to the things I'm sure that I have said in the early days of this podcast, Rome did not, in fact, steal their mythology from Greece. They were influenced, yes, and they often have gods that can be seen as the same as Greek gods, but with different Roman names, but that is simply due to their proximity to Greece, like Greek influence and other factors that all just led to similar gods and some shared mythology. But they are shared, not stolen. In any event, the Roman idea of Eros is, of course, Cupid. Other than Apuleius's golden ass, I'm not really familiar with many Roman myths of Cupid, so we're just going to focus on the concept of him. Because, well, the Rome in Rome, too, we have two different Cupids. We have the Cupid of Cupid and Psyche, a young man who is certainly old enough to fall in love and have a woman fight for him. And then we have the Cupid of some Roman artwork, mosaics and wall paintings and the like. A cursory search of, again, my beloved Theoi.com tells me that there, too, we have Cupid depicted at different ages. But they often have one thing in common. He likes to ride sea life. You heard me. It's unrelated to everything we're talking about, except that he is a child and he likes to ride atop sea life. Go Google it. You won't regret it. Cupid riding dolphins. Cupid riding weird goat fish, guys. Cupid riding crabs. Honestly, Roman art featuring Cupid is a real joy that I did not know that I needed until this very moment. The Romans, too, or at least regions under the Roman Empire, but also pretty inherently Greco-Roman... That's confusing, I know, but that's how it works. Uh, They depict the Erotes as well, being very similar to Cupid, except that there are simply more of them. So through the Roman period, we've got both the god of love, Cupid, and the Erotes, not only living on from their Greek origins, but also maintaining those childlike elements that came about in the Greek sources. The name Cupid, of course, then becomes this dominant name for the god of love, because the Roman names for most of the gods become dominant. 
To put it in the absolute simplest of terms, when in fact I am sure there is so much more to say about how exactly this happens and why, but basically it's just that, well, Latin becomes the dominant language, and thus so do the gods' names. Latin gets taken on by the Catholic Church, so it just remains, in a way that ancient Greek didn't. Not that it wasn't still read and used, but in terms of dominant languages that then spread across the European continent, it's Latin. But the full-blown baby cherubic cupid that we think of now, that appears on all the bizarre Valentine's Day decor of at least North America, is still yet to be born. Enter the Renaissance. It seems to me that this is as simple as just artist depictions of Cupid transforming how the culture saw him. A cute, chubby baby Cupid with his little wings and his bow and arrow is considerably cuter to paint in that typical Renaissance style than a teenager. Is there more to it? Oh, I am certain that there is. However, I am simply theorizing at this point because we have left behind the Greek mythology origins and entered into the live is too tired from Sparta to do deep research era. So I have covered all that actually matters about Greek and Roman and their god of love, and now we're just thinking aloud about why he's such a weird little baby in later artwork. I don't know, I think it's the Renaissance. I had such goals for diving deep into this episode, but frankly I was biting off more than I could chew and this episode is more than enough! Ultimately, we only care about Greco-Roman mythology anyway, don't we? When I started writing this episode, I wanted to talk about the question of how and why the idea of Eros, later Cupid, turned into exclusively a weird little baby shooting arrows at people on overly commercialized greeting cards. But I kind of had it in my head that it would be this kind of simple transition from Eros as a teenager or young adult through time to Cupid as a baby cherub. But it really didn't go that way. I often forget that Eros in Greek art and iconography is often a baby himself, or rather just very small, because again, one of the joys of ancient Greek pottery is that babies and children are typically just tiny adults. I love them. They're weird. And so yeah, even in the ancient Greek world, we get this young baby Eros and an older, more nefarious Eros. There isn't a through line and there isn't any kind of continuity, even just a general timeline. It's it's kind of all happening at once in this really interesting way. And then you add in the two gods of love, or rather the two possible gods of love, this like big love and little love, and you get this incredibly and wonderfully complex character who is simultaneously all of those things and, well, like barely a character at all. In the ancient Greek sources, he is almost exclusively an agent of chaos or just an agent of love, but that love is usually chaotic. But he's never really in the stories for himself. He's never the subject. He's always the verb. If that actually makes any sense grammatically. It's only when we get to the story of Cupid and Psyche in the Roman period that we get a Cupid who actually gets to take part in the act of love rather than just being the agent of it. One day I will cover that story again. It is truly something else. And gods, do I know how much you all love it. Those are still some of my most popular episodes. Because everyone loves a good love story, right? Bet you thought this episode was going to be that. (laughs) Eros is a menace, but he is also utterly fascinating. Ugh, nerds. How do I continue to manage to make these episodes so long? I figured I would really have to stretch this one out because of how much Eros didn't actually feature into the stories in the way that we want him to. But nope, there's too much to say about the concepts and the ideas and gods. I do love mythology for all its intricacies and weirdness and pure chaotic wonder. So I've talked enough for today. Let's end it with a fun five-star review. Consider giving me one, won't you? This one comes from the wonderful user JSTEMPOW. It could just be those letters, I don't know. From my own country of Canada. Rebalancing the scales. Other than the sheer fact that Myths Baby is an excellent pod that is very clear about delving into myths from a modern feminist perspective, I'm writing this to counter the last one-star review. Anytime someone uses the word shrill in reference to a woman, their opinion is automatically invalid and sent to baby jail. Keep up the amazing work, Liv. (laughs) Thank you. I agree. We do not use the word shrill. Ugh. Let's Talk About Myths Baby is written and produced by me, Liv Albert. Michaela Smith is the Hermes to my Olympians and handles so many podcast-related things. She's an absolute gem and I couldn't do it without her. Stephanie Foley works to transcribe the podcast for YouTube captions and accessibility. 
The podcast is hosted and monetized by Acast. Help me continue bringing you the world of Greek mythology and the ancient Mediterranean by becoming a patron, where you'll get bonus episodes and more. Visit patreon.com slash mythsbaby or click the link in this episode's description. Thank you, you wonderful nerds. You are awesome. I am Liv, and gods, I love this shit so much. Thank you.